Welcome to today's panel titled Top Execs Discuss How RPA Won't Replace Jobs. I'm Christina Cowden. I'm a program manager and developer at UiPath, and I created coursework as an instructor for the newly released RPA Developer Nano Degree Program. I'll be moderating today's panel. Joining me today is Brian Lamb, CEO of What is RPA, Sydney Madison Prescott, Automation Lead at Spotify, Partha Baral, Head of COE at HP, and Weston Jones, Intelligent Automation Lead at PwC. In today's panel, we'll discuss how RPA and automation will support, not supplant, the jobs of today and tomorrow. So let's jump in. First, I've prepared some questions for each of our panelists. And then at the end of this session, we'll take a few minutes to answer some audience collected questions. My first question is for Brian. Let's talk about RPA and its applications. How does it help workers? Sure. So uh, I'm going to pose most, I'm going to frame most of my responses for people who haven't necessarily been exposed to RPA. So for me, RPA at its core is performing a very consistent series of steps upon similar looking data with very few variations against a fixed set of rules that don't require any human judgment at all. So in many companies, people are still doing very repetitive work like that, often involving copying and pasting or retyping information from source documents into systems like CRMs and whatnot, or even from one system to other systems. So they're basically redoing work over and over again. They call that swivel chair work. So work like this makes humans actually behave in a robotic fashion. So the objective of RPA ultimately is to identify tasks like this and rapidly create automated solutions that relieve humans from doing that kind of what we call low value work and freeing them up to do higher value tasks that involve more thought and vision. So ultimately a sense of fear though can arise from those workers that the automation will totally replace them. And to mitigate that, I like to tell people right up front, you know, listen, I'm not here to take your job. I'm actually here to give you an Iron Man suit. And if you've ever seen the Iron Man movies, you know that there's a human inside this mechanized suit that is capable of doing all these really cool things and providing them information, helping them make decisions and doing things in an automated fashion. So I like to see, I like to present RPA as a uh, synergy between machines and humans, allowing the humans to ultimately be basically superheroes. Awesome. That's a great response. And so my next question is for Sydney, pretty related as what types of jobs will change as a result of using RPA? And how does it change the workspace? So now that you're giving these people less of a robotic job for themselves to do, what's going to change? Thanks, Kristen. So there are a lot of different industries today that are leveraging RPA. So everything from uh, financial systems to healthcare. Uh, I've even seen um, NASA is starting to leverage RPA. So it's a it's a rapidly expanding technology. So I, I think to your first question, which industries, I think it's, it's a broad spectrum. Uh, and what we're really looking at is fundamentally changing the way that humans work within these different, uh, within these different industries and within the different verticals uh, in each uh, job area. So it's, it's really, to Brian's point, stripping away the manual repetitive tasks. And as a result, what we are doing is we truly are amplifying the ability of our human workforce to really do several different things. Um, one, to work on more value added tasks. So meaning rather than uh, sitting and pivoting data tables, I'm giving that work to a robot. And now what I can do is I can actually do, uh, I, can, I can create a bigger space for myself to engage with customers, with client uh, focused uh, engagements rather than the, the data pivoting. Um, it also allows me to do a lot more analysis on my data. Um, so rather than typically we're moving through things so quickly, just trying to get these routine tasks done, we can actually take the time to do the deep dives into the, into the data. And as a result, we're really allowing ourselves the ability to um, create more data driven decision making. And that in and of itself has a great value to a business. So I think it's, it's going to be pivoting us away from the manual. It's going to be allowing us to do more of those cognitive tasks, more of the critical thinking tasks, um, a lot more data analytics, going to really also amplify our ability to provide uh, better data quality, uh, better data governance in our different sy disparate systems, legacy systems. And then also it's providing us with um, a really unique way
way to be more innovative. And I've seen a lot of great uses of RPA to actually innovate within a given space. So it, it allows you that almost the space to be more creative in how you actually execute your business processes um, on a daily basis, but also on a monthly and quarterly basis as well. Oh, I love that. That's a great answer. And so Partha, could you possibly give us an example of how RPA has supported a workforce instead of supplanting it? Sure, sure. No, I appreciate the question. And I think I, I like Brian's um, analogy of iron, giving an iron suit to the, to the human employees where you can actually do more things, but you also have the, the intelligence and the insight that the iron suit provides you. So I'll give you an example of where we actually applied the same concept, but in a little bit different context, where actually uh, uh, an operational leader, he, had, he was managing uh, a sales ops teams, and that sales ops teams was, one part of the team was responsible for assigning accounts to a sales um, rep, because that's a typical territory management problem. And because of the company data issue and other things, they were putting a lot of people to do that look at the request coming in, look at the account data, go into the CRM system, take that opportunity or take that account and send it to a sales rep. So that was a very mechanical task. They were looking at a spreadsheet of the rules and all of that. However, the challenge was the business leader was also looking at taking on more value-added work to manage the renewal business, which they didn't have the resources for. So one of the things that we did was we, um, automated that manual task of territory assignment using RPA. And we were able to actually take the same resources um, and take the manual work out of their hands, automate that with RPA, but then they give them the opportunity to really drive the renewal business and the growth because there they were, they had a lot more value-added activity of looking at really the renewal opportunities, making sure that they are understanding the customer who's about to renew, who's not interacting with the customers to give them the early notifications so that they are renewing at the right time. So those were a lot more value-added work so we had the same workforce, give them value-added work, but also able to do uh, more work with the same workforce, but with a little bit of little bit more automation with RPA. So that's a, that was a classic example where it benefited the the, the operation leader, it benefited the the, the entire team, but also um, the business overall. No, that's a great one. Thank you. And so Sydney, I do want to come back to you. You have extensive experience implementing RPA and. Um, automation tools in general. So what's your prediction for RPA adoption and what can workers do to prepare for it? So RPA adoption is definitely accelerating. Um, we've seen that over the, the past few years. We see the, um, the analysis that uh, entities such as Gartner are doing on uh, the growth in the business and, and those future projections. And when we look at the adoption rate, it's definitely accelerating. I see that continuing uh, for the next, I would say, uh, at least three to five years. One of the, the ways that we are changing in a way how we are adopting uh, RPA technologies is there's been a definitely a heavy, decisive shift towards platforms that are um, multifaceted, meaning they have RPA capabilities, but they also have some, um, some AI, maybe cognitive capabilities. They may have OCR components, and then they may also have some, some different machine learning uh, models that are already built in that you may or may not be able to customize. So I see that, def that trend of uh, businesses who require uh, more of a, almost like a hyper automation, like a true automation platform where we're embracing the, that entire tool stack of intelligent automation rather than just the standalone RPA tools. Um, I think, and, and in terms of workers, what can they do to prepare? Definitely um, this Udacity and being able to take courses here, uh, upskilling yourself again, not just on RPA, but also machine learning, upskilling yourself on OCR, um, upskilling yourself on uh, natural language processing, all of these uh, different components of cognitive automation are coming together. And the, the workforce of the future should have uh, a, a very strong grasp of all of these different concepts, as well as how they all play and interact together. Yeah, I think that's great. And so Weston, do you see a majority of workers fearing being displaced by technology? Um, 
like do you think that they'll be expecting to work with it more or do you see that that's really instilled in them that they're kind of avoiding it and not wanting to make that shift yes so thank you christina um so what what typically happens when we start talking about these programs is that a lot of people get concerned about this being displaced but you know it's it's just the natural change process you know change is difficult for a lot of people and what we try to do is just show them kind of how these tools can be used and what ends up happening is they see all the work that they don't want to do kind of being taken away kind of like when brian talked about his example we talked too about this idea that everybody has a robot inside of them doing you know these manual repetitive tasks and so what we do is we automate those things and then what people say is, wow, my job's so much more interesting. I like to do, you know, a lot of name um, and per make it a person that they use. Um, and they, they really start to enjoy having them um, do those activities for them. So I think over, overall, people have gotten um, very comfortable with it. And it has, as Sydney mentioned, they start to learn other things like data visualization and other things that are becoming easier and easier to learn. So you think that it's more of they, as they, uh, they fear it until they understand it. And once they understand a, it, then they're okay with expecting more. Yeah, that's a great point. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Well, that's good to know that the more you know, the less fear you have. Um, and so that brings me back to Brian. There is more of a need for automated tasks, especially as COVID-19 continues to proliferate around the world. And so how has RPA helped companies operate during the pandemic? I know that they commented on it in the keynote, but I, we'd love to hear kind of this panel's ideas on it as well. Sure. Yeah, and, and like I mentioned before, since RPA shines at repeating a repetitive series of steps against a large data set, you know, the, the pandemic created many ideal RPA use cases. It's almost like a match made in heaven as, as, as you know, terrible as the situation is. It's amazing that UiPath uh, was on the scene and allowed us to be able to do this kind of stuff. You know, obviously two main industries that saw a lot of use would be something like travel and hospitality and then the healthcare side of things. Uh, you know, we know that due to global lockdowns and restrictions, we saw just mass cancellations of and refunds of flights and cruises and hotel bookings and events at hundreds of companies worldwide. So most companies aren't staffed to handle volume surges like that. And the problem was of course compounded by the fact that existing employees couldn't even come into the office to access various systems that were needed to process that work. So fortunately RPA implementations can be fairly quick to create and deploy and we can automatically perform those cancellations and refunds 24 hours a day, seven days a week, using existing systems and processes the same way a human would, and leaving only small percentages of exceptions for the humans to analyze and process. So that basically allowed um, you know, us to be able to handle that massive surge of work and relegate only the, some of the things that are maybe outliers for humans to deal with. A couple of uh, perfect examples of that would be like there was a, a food processing company in Chile. And since there were lockdowns of traveling from city to city, um, this, this particular food processing company utilized RPA to pull information out of their SAP employee repository and submit it to the government to get um, commuter passes that would allow them to you know, transit on the highways going from their city to where they needed to work because they were essential employees. So they were able to spin up an automation that requested um, these commuter passes for 12,000 employees. And that would normally have taken six people like months to do that. And it turned around, they did it in five hours using RPA. So that's one perfect example of how uh, RPA was used. And of course, in the healthcare side of things, uh, there's a lot of desire to understand the impact of this particular virus. So there are many data sources all over the place and it's possible to use RPA to sort of pull down information on a recurring basis into some sort of central aggregated form so that we can do better analysis on that data. And then so the, <clears throat> excuse me, the example that you used, did they already implement RPA before the pandemic or was that also just kind of like 
we need to adopt RPA because of the pandemic. And then we also used it very quickly. Yeah, it was absolutely a response to the pandemic. Um, I think when faced with great challenges like this, companies, uh, the best leaders and the best companies are agile and are capable of pivoting to absorb challenges that they might experience in, in the environment or in the workplace. So I think they probably went out and did research and said, hey, you know, they reached out, reached out to their, their resources and said, you know, how can we solve this problem? And of course, RPA has been a, uh, a hot topic for the past couple of years for a variety of other reasons. So I think it was, it was on the tip of people's tongues and they were like, you know what, we can throw RPA down here real quick. So I don't think they probably had RPA in place at a food processing company necessarily, but it was definitely a response to the emergence of this pandemic to solve that problem. Wow, that's great to hear. Um, and then Sydney, I want to come back to you. Can you speak to the types of skills workers would need if they wanted to move into implementing RPA or becoming an RPA developer? I would definitely say first things first, being able to identify tools that are in the marketplace from an educational standpoint. Uh, again, going back to Udacity, going back to uh, a lot of the, the vendor platforms that have uh, different educational kind of tips and tools and tricks. Uh, being able to research and leverage all of the, the different kind of knowledge, uh, knowledge translation tools that are out there um, is great. And now there's a, there's a wide variety of information uh, that's out here based on, you know, how to learn RPA, upskilling and RPA, um, even just becoming more familiar with the vendors and the big players in the marketplace is also important. Um, one big skill that I would say is being able to think critically and being able to uh, really have a creative mindset where you're able to think outside of the box. A lot of the solutioning that we do at Spotify, we're looking specifically at how do we approach a business problem from a completely different angle? And this really requires that you um, not even think outside of the box, but it's really about thinking that there is no box. So, you know, what do I want to create? How do I want to create it? Uh, and what are the, the tools and, and tips and other resources that are at my disposal to do that uh, with RPA? So having a creative mindset, uh, being a, a more of a, a bit of an innovative thinker, uh, critical thinker, and then also being able to really understand um, process flows and being someone who uh, is very data driven. I think that that serves you very well in the RPA space, being able to um, understand a process, being able to pinpoint the potential areas where you can optimize that process with automation, and then also being able to adequately communicate um, to both business stakeholders, but also technical SMEs. Um, this this is a great skill to have in terms of are you able to take complex technical um, ideas and can you can you talk about them, speak about them in such a way that they are easily communicated to business stakeholders who may uh, not be so technically savvy? Um, I think that's the, the the individuals that I work with who really shine in terms of uh, their contributions to an RPA team are able to seamlessly interface between the business and the technical components of, uh, of the enterprise. That's awesome. And I'd actually, I have a follow-up question and Brian, Parther, Weston, you can join in on this one. Are there people in your organization who have reskilled or upskilled themselves? And if so, what were their backgrounds? Like, were they typically a software developer already within your organization or did they come from something completely different and you saw that those critical thinking skills and those creative skills and problem solving translated well into the RPA developer role. And I can chime in on that real quick. Um, at Pacific Life where I work in my day job, uh, we have been trying to drive what's called citizen developers where you know, not necessarily a formal RPA developer is going to be doing some work, but we have like an analyst, for instance, on a particular team. He came in and he, he knew that there was a need to process like 30,000 items in this particular system. And it was going to take six people the better part of a year to accomplish that. So he had heard that I was uh, doing the RPA programming and he approached me. So I said, hey, let's make you my first official citizen developer. So he was an analyst. He had done some Python programming in the past, but had never really um, done automation per se. And there are certain things with automation that are very important, especially things like error handling. 
you want something that's going to repeat over and over again for 30,000 times. And if for some reason an error comes up, you certainly don't want it just to tip over and die in the middle of the work, right? So he had to pick up that mindset, the, the mindset of, okay, I need to anticipate problems I might have and put uh, solutions, error handling into place in this robot. So he had to learn the ability to put transactions into a queue and how multiple different robots could consume that queue at the same time. So that way you can scale out the work across multiple machines. So he had to get that mindset of let's put all the work in one queue and then allow multiple robots to be able to, you know, consume that queue and also make sure that each one of those robots, if it encounters a problem, is not just going to tip over and die and leave some work half done. Um, I um, wanted to add something to what Sydney says on this question is RPA is our automation in general is not just about building and development. There's a different types of way you need to think about the, the nature of the automation, the problem uh, where you really can take advantage. And, and again, going back to um, Weston's comment is the more you educate them, the better they'll be equipped to look at the problem in a different way, where even, even if it's an automation problem in the traditional sense where you had to send it to IT for development and other things. But here, if you really think about a problem in a different way, you can apply creative solutions and then you can use the RPA technology really to build the solutions together. So there are many different types of skills that are required to make this work. And that's what I think the beauty of this is every body can participate as long as they are learning what the potentials are um, learning and adapting to how to look at problems differently and what tools that they have either at their disposal or at the disposal um, of the broader community to really address, this, address the, the challenge. That's a good point. So I wanted to comment a little bit on what Sydney had said because um, knowing the process, knowing the technology, and then knowing the data are really kind of the sweet spot um, for these technologies. And, we were fortunate enough uh, five years ago, our leadership you know, met with Daniel Dinez and Daniel had this vision of you know, a bot for every person. And so we started our citizen development like Brian has talked about you know, five years ago. So we bought licenses for all 55,000 of our employees in the US and everyone, every single person, you know, um, assistants to partners was trained and was able to build a bot. And then we added in um, Altrix to do data visualization and some of those things. And a lot of the individuals, at least in our client facing side, already have process knowledge about their specific verticals. But that really kind of changed things and it allowed us to develop bots, put them on a store so anyone could get them and kind of reuse them a lot. And it was really, it's the other piece to enterprise automation um, doing the big automations through SAP or some ERP, you still have all those task automations to do. And this allows those individuals to kind of develop those and then share them with others. And that's, that's kind of where the two come together. And it's really powerful. So I actually have a question for you then, Weston or Brian. How big is an automation that a citizen developer would be expected to kind of build? Like you're saying that these people all have a bot and they all built one and some people if they're not aware of rpa um like we were saying earlier it might be kind of scary <laughs> but once they yeah. learn about it how and far i'll chime in there i'll chime in there basically it's really an it depends uh to follow up on wetson's answer I, I love the fact that you guys have gone to such big scale like that because with these programs like udacity and, and how how intuitive the uipath tool is uipath is almost going to become something akin to using excel you know people who are coming up out of school they've been you know using excel their whole lives and and this is basically just another productivity tool similar to excel that allows people to be more effective at work so my answer is you know, you can use Excel for little onesie twosie lists and you can use Excel for these gigantic dashboards with really cool formulas and such. So, you know, looking at it, analogizing it from, a, from the Excel standpoint, you can use UiPath to do these little quick things. Like maybe, you've, you're, maybe your time card is the same every single week. So you, you write up a little robot and you use that to fill in your time card every week. You know, something as, as innocuous as that compared to this other thing I talked about where you're processing 30,000 rows of business critical information uh, that would have taken a year to do. So, you know, apples and oranges in that case. Yeah, and I think there's, gov there's governance too 
that kind of states when we want to use a citizen developer versus using something from the enterprise perspective. And like Brian said, if you're doing, you know, financial statement close, um, you've got a lot of different accounts you're working with and account reconciliations. A lot of times you can do that from an enterprise perspective, but there's always some work that's kind of left over, no matter how hard you try to do everything through a big system, there's always, you know, bank statement reconciliation or something out there. And this way, you know, accountants within, you know, our teams can actually build the automation to do, you know, one-off tasks like that, that they still have to do. So I yeah. think it becomes really obvious to the, to the individual when they look at their job, the things that they do repetitively to be able to do the automations there. Yeah. Just to be like, what's, what's easy enough for me to do. And it doesn't have to go through the whole ranking and, assign an RPA developer. That's a great way to look at it. And so I have a follow-up question on that. You mentioned Alteryx, um, but what other types of collaboration tools can help the workforce enhance RPA? And maybe yeah, explain I, a little I like bit how other you're using Alteryx. <laughs> sure. No, I, I'd love to hear other people's answers to this too, because this new normal, I mean, we flipped to virtual and this is something that, you know, a lot of people were questioning. Can you really virtually kind of have a distributed development kind of um, project? And so it pushed all these things like, you know, how many of us knew of Zoom, you know, before earlier this year? Um, so like these collaboration tools like Zoom and other for video conferencing. Um, we also started to use uh, these virtual whiteboarding tools where we can have workshops and everything's kind of written on the whiteboards. We do that a lot. Um, document collaboration, you know, if you're using G Suite or Teams or something like that, being able to, to work on a document together. Um, utilizing, you know, project management tools, something like a JIRA or, or, or something like that. You can kind of manage those things from all cent from a central location. And then having a knowledge kind of repository, something like a Confluence or a Guru. You know, those are the types of things that, you know, we should have been using probably when we were, you know, in our offices. But now those have become kind of critical. And what they do is the benefits aren't just that you can collaborate more easily, you, you know, you can get global teams involved. You can, um, you know, record everything um, that you're doing. You can um, get notes of the whiteboards. I mean, there's so many benefits to it um, that it really, we've not really seen a big um, um, reduction in productivity by going virtual. I mean, you sure you miss a lot of the one-off meetings and catching someone in the hall. But those collaboration tools have, um, people have gotten so good at them that they, they've worked really well. I think the other few other kind of the dimension to this, I believe as we look at citizen development, as we look at broadening the, the RPA developer, quote unquote community, I think there are some tools that drives more the community engagement as well as the collaboration and sharing, whether you're using Microsoft Teams to do that, whether you're using Slack to do that, or there are other tools like even UiPath has Automation Hub, which builds also, also a lot of collaboration capability across the community of, of people that are interested in automation, that are driving some of the ideation. Um, that's also a great uh, mechanisms to get the people um, connected to each other, share with each other, and then mm -hmm. promote the concepts as well. I would definitely agree with that. We've seen a lot of acceleration uh, specifically within citizen development and within the unattended automations that we're doing uh, throughout the, the pandemic, which has been really interesting. Uh, and we have been leveraging very heavily the like mural, which is the, the virtual whiteboarding, uh, JIRA, definitely leveraging automation hub, uh, which UiPath provides to, to, with the gamification and the sharing uh, of code snippets. And, and it's been really great to see that we, whether we're working with our teams in Sweden, whether we're working with teams in the US, that all of these collaboration tools combine with UiPath path um, have actually allowed us to accelerate the the demand that we have within Spotify for RPA, uh, whether it's attended or unattended automation. And all great points. I'll toss in one more thing there. Uh, never underestimate the value of using a screen recorder or, you know, whether it be Zoom or whatever, record those meetings when you're doing demos. Uh, like Sydney mentioned earlier, you know, robot developers often are people who can 
uh, empathize very well with the business, but also know the technical stuff. So you need to have very high fidelity conversations between the business people and the people who are going to be creating the robots if you're not using uh, uh, citizen developers. So recording those meetings and putting them into whatever the requirements repository is allows the you know, uh, analyst to go and watch that video and write requirements. It allows the tester to watch that video and write test cases. It allows the RPA developer to watch that video and uh, create the actual functionality. So when you record the demo and put it into the requirements, people can run off and start being productive right away from that demo video instead of everybody waiting around for the requirements to be written and all that kind of stuff. Wow, that's awesome. I love that everybody had a point of view on that and it was all very different, but the same. So Partha, I just wanna come back to you um, and to ask you, what advice would you give to automation leaders who wanna implement RPA today? So they're hearing all the things you guys just said about citizen developers, about different um, ways of people getting involved and automating during COVID and using collaboration tools. So could you also tell us something that maybe the leaders would tell their employees about the increase in automation and how it would help their careers? Sure, sure. No, thank you for that question. It is a great question. And, and having had the opportunity to do this, uh, enable this at scale in three different companies, uh, I can certainly share a little bit of a perspective. And I think the first I want to start with, it is about the people. So yes, we talk about automation, but at the end of the day, uh, as a leader, if you are not focusing on the people, you're gonna get limited success. So first you have to start with the people and going back to again, Weston's comment, the more you know, the less fear you get, but also the more interested you become. So you have to take, think about what are you going to do about your workforce? How are you going to um, enable them with the future of work skills, right? So that they really get interested into this and how do you take them along the journey? I'll give you one quick example on that particular topic. I was, I was um, um, doing a workshop um, in India um, with a group of operational teams that actually are doing the work. And my, the workshop was about teach them about RPA, but also get them excited about it. Now, obviously, I cannot go into the discussion with talking about saying that your job is going to be taken away. So my, the positioning that I did, and which is, again, genuine, is I told them, if you had an assistant tomorrow, and here are the skills that assistant has, think about delegating your work. So if you had an option tomorrow to delegate your work, what is the work that you'd love to give it to somebody else so that you can really spend the time learning, doing better things and, and, and kind of focusing on valued activity. And so not surprisingly enough, people were volunteering there, all of these opportunities that can be automated. So you have to take the people along this journey with you so that they are with you and they are actually supporting and helping the automation journey and the value creation, number one. Number two is, yes, RPA, given the, the, the nature of automation, it's easy to get into. But soon, if you do really have to think about um, getting the maximum value out of it, you have to think about scaling right from the beginning. How you're going to scale, what are the different elements to think about. One big aspect is about security, governance, um, environment, uh, standards. So some of these types of things you have to start to put in place once you align on that it is something that you want to take on at an enterprise level. So first people, then scale. Third is, this goes back to the, the really the maturity of RPN where we can see the, the, the biggest benefit. Again, whether we talk about hyper automation, whether we talk about citizen level development, you really need to think about how do you energize a community get them engaged in this journey of new way of automating, a new way of uh, driving business innovation. So uh, to, to summarize, first start with people. Second, think about the scale. What are the different factors that go into, that prohibits you to scale? Because today RPA, a lot of adoption is happening, but the scaling is a big topic. Um, that's, that's out in the industry being talked about. And then third is, how are you going to build energize and, and kind of really build a momentum with the community that are focusing on automation, innovation, and all of that. 
Wow, that's a great answer. And it comes across um, a memory I have with a client where they went to all their lowest level employees and asked, what do you hate about your job? And they got very similar lists of if you had the assistance. So it's very relevant. Um, but now I want to pivot, pivot to take a moment to answer some questions that were collected prior to the panel. Um, and so our first one comes in from Twitter. Dilov asks, does RPA mean that I have to get rid of any existing systems in my company? And so Sydney, could you take that one? Yes, absolutely. So it does not. Um, typically, this is one of the, the reasons why RPA is, has gained so much momentum and uh, attention. We really can work with everything from SaaS applications to legacy systems. Uh, so, and it, where we do this, either we can work through the UI, we can work through APIs. Um, so this is great because it allows that flexibility to talk between disparate systems, which may not be connected. Um, there has been a lot of conversation around integrations and like you know when does something get to the point where in your traditional integrations team would tackle that task before RPA uh, but I typically look at if it's something where it's a relatively straightforward um, solution it's a task that a team does today where they basically need to take data from one system that doesn't talk to another system and be able to pivot that data in some sort of way produce outputs be able to produce your um, business exception system exceptions we can automate that with rpa so i haven't seen and i've i've um done now four different scalings of uh, centers of excellence. I haven't seen an instance where we were not able to uh, automate between a system. I mean, typically it, it may come down to um, your permissions, like identity and access management, things like that. But you typically don't, wouldn't say like, oh, I, I have to, like this system, I am unable to automate with RPA. That's good to hear. <laughs> um. And so we have another question submitted from Jacob via Twitter, which is, I want to implement RPA at my company, but it could be out of the organization's budget. So is there a way to implement RPA in a cost effective way? Partha, do you mind taking that one? Sure, sure. Um, now cost effective way, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of interpretation of that, but I think um, RPA as an investment, it's, it's very low cost investment at the beginning. So one way to address that is, you can really build a proof of concept, show the value. And once you get the people aligned to show the value, you can slowly start ramping up. And then um, there is a concept that you can apply, which is called seed funding. So you get a little bit of funding and through that you generate outcome, which basically self-fund the RPA initiative. So that's one approach that you can take is one, create a, again, there are a lot of free tools available free trainings and community edition even from UiPath that you can use to demonstrate and the, the value and the effectiveness. Once you get that, your funding model can be yes, if you have limited budget, you can start with the seed funding and then using the value equation, really kind of the, the, the self-fund the initiative. Uh, and then as it starts to really gain momentum, uh, you will get you will get the the, the buy-in and the funding because as you can see a lot of the enterprises are rightfully so adopting this this way of automation because it is creating additional value than what we could have could have done before so to start with you can think about a seed funding you can think about doing a proof of concept and then a self-funding model and that's where i think you can start the ball rolling that's a great answer thank you and so then we have another question from Ellie. RPA is used to replace or streamline mundane tasks. Do you foresee a time when it can be used to make more strategic decisions in an organization? So Brian, do you mind answering that one? Sure. Uh, I'm gonna take it back to basically all of my previous responses. Like you just said, uh, RPA's primary scope is to do very, uh, uh, consistent sets of steps against large uh, bodies of data. So RPA is traditionally best suited for just doing grunt work like a robot would do, repeating things over and over again. So that's the kind of thing that doesn't require a lot of human judgment. So I'm going to assert that uh, RPA does all of that sort of grunt work so that humans can be freed up to make strategic decisions like that. 
Uh, one important um, sidebar is that normally when humans are doing that grunt work and acting like robots, they're doing the tasks, copying and pasting, typing stuff from one system to, to another. And there's not a lot of um, extra data being thrown off or persisted into any particular systems. And as we know, strategic decisions depend upon insights that we can glean from data in our systems. So if you can build an RPA solution such that it not only does the work, but it also emits relevant data about the process into some kind of a system that we can then perform insights and analysis on that will effectively enable those strategic decisions. So while RPA doesn't necessarily do the strategic decision, it enables strategic decisions. That's awesome, thanks. And then my last question, I'm gonna ask Wes then to answer this one. Um, this was sent to us from Dave. There's a lot of talk about how RPA is used in a business context. Is there a case for using it in people's day-to-day -day lives? So he's specifically talking about help with homeschooling. I was on mute. So the, yes, so, so, you know, we've all talked about Brian, Parth and Sydney have talked about how if you do something repetitive over and over again, um, those tend to be really good opportunities for automation. So the more that they do those at homeschooling, kind of the better the application could be. Um, so you could use, you know, RPA to do a lot of the mundane, kind of, a lot of the tasks that you do um, now. Some of the things that, you know, in education that people have done a lot of automation around is around things like enrollment, um, in, in classes is, is something that people have done a lot because there's usually a lot of uh, issues with um, errors in, in being enrolled in the right class at the right time. You can use automation to understand kind of what the schedule should look like and what classes work with other classes. And it actually can make it a lot easier to select classes. Um, you can use it for grading. Um, there's been a lot of examples of using automation to grade like big quantities of, of tests. Um, you can also do for scheduling, you know, a lot of scheduling is done, um, particularly in home schools, I would imagine, based on kind of all the work that they do with others and they have to coordinate schedules to do that. Um, progress reports is another thing that, that automation is used for, could be used for in homeschooling. Um, something like we talked about earlier, uh, like a citizen kind of development kind of approach with homeschooling could be interesting where you know, there'd be a lot of people that are homeschooling their kids and in and about themselves don't do a certain activity a lot. That group does it a lot. So maybe there's one person that wants to develop a bot to do registration and then everyone uses it. So they post it somewhere and anyone can use that bot. And to divide that up um, for things like that would be something that would be very cool. And I think you know, we've all talked about the technology gets easier and easier and you're going to start seeing um, it being used more and more. I mean, there's simple things like, you know, you can get a, uh, a bot that basically it's the bottom of your signature. And if someone wants to have a meeting with you, they can basically click on that and they can schedule a meeting and that bot will schedule that meeting for them. Um, so a lot of applications, it's going to get, um, easier to use and there's going to be more kind of places that you can use it because it's going to be be that much easier hopefully that awesome. helps <laughs> thank you great example thank you so much but we're at time so this is a great place to stop and thank you to all of our panelists for joining me today and thank you to the audience for attending this concludes our panel discussion and please come back at 11 a.m pacific time to watch the next panel discussion titled how has COVID accelerated the need for rpa Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah.